consciousness itself is arguably the greatest mystery facing modern science today. Every single one of us is conscious. There's no experience of life without consciousness, and yet no one truly knows. No one truly knows what consciousness is. The hard problem of consciousness is one of the greatest mysteries, one of the greatest unanswered questions facing modern science today. You must be some kind of therapist. I am some kind of therapist, and I'm about to take you on a journey through the inner wilderness. I've invited brilliant guests from all walks of life to join me as we investigate, illuminate, and inspire transformation in ourselves, intimate relationships, and the social ecosystems we are constellated in. What you are about to hear may surprise you, so hang on to your earbuds for a hefty dose of sanity in a chaotic world. I am Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist, branching out and building bridges between psychology and everything else under the sun. It's my honor to have you along for the ride. Let's get started. I'm so excited today to welcome my guest, Jonas Rosen of the YouTube channel Cosmic Consciousness with Jonas. I invited Jonas today because he has some very unique experiences in the realm of psychedelics. Jonas has been leading psychedelic retreats in Jamaica for the last, how long now? About two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of experience um, being present with people and supporting them while they're in altered states of consciousness, would you say? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, let me say thank you so much for inviting me on and having me on here. Uh, true pleasure to be here today and and share and explore together. Yeah, uh, psychedelic assisted therapy has really been a passion of mine for about a decade now, going back to my very first experience when I just intuitively could sense the the potential of this work of this medicine, and uh, that that since that time has really inspired me to dive head first and uh, explore for myself, but also see how I can show up in, in support of others. And you have a background in psychology, right? Yes. So my background is as a licensed master of social work uh, with sort of a specialization in mindfulness-based interventions. And the, the work with, with psychedelics, uh, psychedelic-assisted therapy, part of the reason why I love it is because it's so interdisciplinary it draws on so many different bodies of knowledge. So definitely, it's. I think it's really important to have a number of solid frameworks in terms of uh, psychological and, and psychotherapeutic uh, work. But of course, it also draws on much more than that on, on uh, uh, the somatic side, somatic uh, experiencing, as well as, you know, the whole spiritual and mystical component. Certainly, this this is an experience that taps into all domains of the human experience from the psychological, the mental, the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the transcendent, transpersonal. And so my background in, in social work has been extremely relevant, uh, but of course it extends far beyond that. And so in Jamaica, all psychedelics are legal, is that right? Yes, uh, plant-based psychedelics are legal in Jamaica. So the work I do is at a uh, psilocybin assisted retreat center. It's called Myco Meditations. And uh, yeah, all the work that we do there is 100% legal. So there's so much more room to experiment and explore this subject in the part of the world where you've been based. So you've been saying psychedelic assisted therapies. Now, of course, in the United States, the field of psychotherapy is heavily regulated. So we're really talking about a whole different ball game when you go to a place where psychedelics are legal and these types of retreats that you do are an option for people who want to explore their psyches and different ways of healing. So for those who've never heard this phrase before, what is psychedelic-assisted therapy? Really, psychedelic-assisted therapy is the use of plant medicines, psychedelic medicines, which also include uh, non-plant-based medicines such as ketamine and MDMA, although those fall into a slightly different class from the, the sort of classical psychedelics. But the idea is to use these really powerful substances that induce non-ordinary states of consciousness that bring up all of this psychological material, often out of the unconscious or the subconscious mind, into the light of awareness so that it can then be processed, released, healed, uh, uncovered, 
uh, in conjunction with psychotherapeutic support. So all of these really incredible outcomes that we're seeing out of you know, the research from Johns Hopkins, Imperial College of London, NYU, and uh, different prestigious research institutes around, around the world is not just the effect of the psychedelic substance itself. It's really important to acknowledge that it, it is the psychedelic experience in combination with professional, competent uh, psychotherapeutic support before the experience, during the experience, and very importantly, after the experience as well, to sort of integrate uh, the experience. That integration phase is where we sort of leverage uh, the new insights and awareness that we've uh, gleaned in the experience itself into real life, real world transformation. You mentioned research, and I want to come back to that. I'm especially curious, how would you say that psychedelic assisted therapy is similar to as well as different from regular psychotherapy? That's a really good question. Um, I guess you could say ultimately the fundamentals of the process are the same. It's about increasing self-awareness of challenging uh, psychological dynamics, uh, which often include repressed uh, or suppressed uh, unconscious aspects of the psyche, uh, repressed emotions, memories, experiences, traumas, going back to earliest childhood and, and potentially even before then. Uh, bringing these up into the light of awareness in a compassionate and non-judgmental uh, way, and then working through that material to unburden these powerful emotional charges that uh, often manifest in the symptoms of depression, anxiety, PTSD, addiction, um, and sort of maladaptive uh, coping strategies, right? I guess you could say the difference is that as far as I, my experience goes and what I've observed, and, and this is certainly substantiated by the research, is that psychedelic assisted therapy is far more efficient in terms of unearthing that uh, repressed or suppressed unconscious material of the psyche. And well, I guess you could say uh, in the psychedelic experience, uh, this opens up domains of experience that are beyond the scope of conventional the conventional psychotherapeutic process. And what I do mean is, is of course, the, the mystical or transpersonal type experiences. But what we also see is the release of, of trauma, of what you could call emotional or energetic blockages that are stored in the body, right? Like it's this really significant idea in psychotherapy that trauma is stored in the body that our emotional emotional wounding is stored almost on a cellular physiological level. And it's absolutely possible to get to those places through uh, a highly skilled, uh, highly competent therapist, but it's it requires a extremely high degree of skill as well as a large investment of time to build rapport, to navigate the client's uh, defense mechanisms as you're working towards some of this core material. Um, and that entire process is just expedited uh, many, many, many times in the, in the psychedelic experience. The psychedelic medicine uh, helps to unearth all of these components of the, of the psyche and bring them up to the surface in a, in a really, really powerful, profound way that is, is just incredibly moving and inspiring uh, and potentially challenging to, to witness in real time and to be a part of in real time. There's a lot more to say about that, but that's kind of uh, a, a rambling summation there, broad overview. So how is it that psychedelics are able to, as you described, sort of accelerate the pace of unearthing these past traumas in the psyche and speeding up the healing process? What's the mechanism by which the psychedelic-assisted therapy process uh, enables that? Really good question. I think to some extent, you know, it's worth acknowledging that our research and understanding around these, these substances is, is still pretty much in its infancy. I mean, it's ironic in a sense that these are ancient. I mean, psilocybin mushrooms have been in use, documented uh, use for thousands of years on uh, most of the uh, continents around the world. Um, in Mesoamerica, the, the use is documented, certainly going back at least two or 3,000 years. Uh, and yet in the present day, uh, through this process of rediscovering these ancient medicines, there's a lot that's unknown. When it comes to the actual like 
neurophysiological or neurochemical uh, mechanisms that underpin the effects of, of all of this, uh, there's still quite a bit of mystery here, right? But what we do understand, and, and I'll just hone in on psilocybin uh, because that's more, more of my expertise, is that when we ingest psilocybin, psilocybin is a prodrug for uh, psilocin, uh, which acts on the serotonin receptors of the brain. And uh, it is shown to uh, increase neuroplasticity as well as neurogenesis. There was an interesting study that was done at Yale a few years ago with rodents giving administering psilocybin to mice. And they found that uh, the dendritic spines or the, the, the dendrites of, of neurons uh, increase, grew by 10%. Uh, it basically hyperconnects the brain. Really interesting to see and enables us to, to forge essentially new pathways of thinking and perceiving the world. Meanwhile, we also know uh, from research that psilocybin and other plant-based uh, psychedelics uh, shut down what's called the default mode network in the brain. And this is basically a neurological system that encapsulates or represents our sort of conditioned way of, of seeing and perceiving the world, our sort of skin encapsulated ego, uh, all of our core beliefs right? And, and our, our, the whole cognitive framework and schema for perceiving and understanding and making sense of life and the world. Uh, basically, this default mode network receives less blood flow uh, in the psychedelic experience. And so uh, it's like the default mode network just kind of comes off offline. The subjective outcome of that is that essentially we're seeing life in the world uh, from this expanded space state, this expansive perspective, uh, seeing, seeing things with fresh eyes, you could say. As a result, we get all of these novel insights into uh, our life, into our psyche, connecting the dots on our psychological history, uh, new insights into what you could call life meaning or purpose, our career, relationships. Um, and, and this is all really, really, really powerful. As well, you could say that uh, as the default mode network comes offline, this facilitates uh, the unearthing of these uh, subconscious or unconscious aspects of the psyche uh, from these really deep down parts of us uh, into our conscious awareness. And again, it's kind of mysterious how that happens, but it just does. And it's remarkable to see how the experience, it's almost like it hones in on that which has the most emotional charge within us. Psilocybin is actually called an abreactive, which does mean that it brings to the surface that which has the most emotional charge within us. But basically, the psychedelic-assisted healing can be conceptualized in three key domains or categories. The first is cognitive insights, uh, getting all these novel insights into the nature of reality, who we are, the psyche, our place in the world, all these things. The second is uh, emotional breakthroughs, cathartic release. So as these like deeply held uh, or, or repressed psychological material comes up to the surface, let's say all of a sudden I'm thinking about uh, an experience that I had when I was four years old that I haven't thought of in years, you know, and yet there's some sort of strong emotional charge related to that memory. Somehow it just pops up into the mind in the psychedelic experience and it's not just a conceptual thing, right? There's a strong emotional charge that's that's related to that. And so as we release that emotion, as that emotion moves through us, uh, the natural, the very natural uh, outcome of that is a, a sense of lightness, a, a healing, and a the pressure valve has been opened. There are these powerful uh, cathartic releases that encompass the entire spectrum of human emotionality that we see in, in the psychedelic experience. And the third domain is, is the mystical experience, which I, which I mentioned before. But in these non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, having these experiences where, uh, you know, peak mountaintop spiritual experiences that people consistently rate as among the top five most meaningful and spiritually profound experiences of their entire lives. When compared to the, the you know, their, their marriage, the birth of a child, the death of a loved one, uh, this is how profound these experiences are. And in these, these mystical states of consciousness, uh, there's oftentimes a feeling of, of profound expansiveness, liberation, you could say, from the sort of confines of our everyday problems and challenges 
it's a radical uh, reframing and recontextualizing of, of, of all of the issues and challenges in our life. It's a sense of being connected, interconnected to a much greater whole than just this one physical body, this one human identity. Uh, oftentimes people will say that they feel uh, a sense of unity with the earth, with nature, with the cosmos. And this sense of profound connection is beyond words, therapeutically, unbelievably healing, unbelievably healing. I do think that a sense of, of disconnect from ourselves, from people around us, from the world at large is really a core component of, of the symptomatology of, of depression and anxiety and a whole host of, of different uh, mental health issues. So, yeah. Wow, Jonas, I'm ready for your TED Talk. <laughs> so let me reflect what I heard. So for anyone who missed this or doesn't know, when you talk about psilocybin, you're talking about magic mushrooms, as they're commonly known. And there's many different kinds of magic mushrooms. It contains psilocybin. And you said these have been found on almost all continents and that there's um, a lot of evidence to suggest that peoples from around the world have historically used these substances in some way. And so when people consume magic mushrooms, they're, they're getting psilocybin, which then turns into psilocin. Yes. And this acts on the serotonin receptors in the brain. It has a number of effects. So one is that it slows the activity of the default mode network, which is, as you said, our habituated ways of thinking, perceiving, relating, and acting. And it increases connectivity between different regions of the brain. So while it's slowing down the default mode network, it's allowing other parts of the brain to communicate with each other in ways that they might not normally. And you said it also uh, increases neurogenesis or the creation of new uh, brain cells. And so while that is taking effect, people are able to have these profound insights. They're able to connect dots, remember things from the past that have had some kind of emotional imprint on them that they haven't been conscious of. And through bringing all that up in the right environment, uh, they can experience healing as well as these mystical experiences. Um, I'm curious what you have to say about fear, because for anyone who has never tried psychedelics, there's, you know, this idea of having a bad trip is something that could be really scary. Um, there might be some contraindications for when psychedelics are not a good idea. And there's also the fear that if I were to take a psychedelic, I would lose control of my behavior or of my grasp on reality. I might go somewhere kind of on the other side and not come back. Um, maybe it could open up some kind of psychosis. I could do something embarrassing. I'm sure the list goes on. And, and in your role, you've probably heard every fear that people have about psychedelics. So tell us about those fears and what's, what's real, right? So what is a bad trip if such a thing exists and who really shouldn't try these substances, but also what are the misconceptions about those fears and how do you help people address those? Uh, I think it's really, really important to acknowledge that even though psychedelics, uh, psychedelic medicines are, uh, incredibly powerful and profound, effective medicines, as well as completely non-toxic, physiologically completely safe. That doesn't mean that everyone is in a place today in their life to benefit from this experience. There are some important contraindications. People with uh, a history of bipolar disorder or any kind of uh, psychosis, psychotic episodes, uh, schizophrenia in, the, in themselves or even in their family history, uh, these are important contraindications because the psychedelic experience can uh, trigger a manic episode or a psychotic episode that continues on beyond the duration of the psychedelic effects of the substance itself. But that being said, you know, there is kind of this idea or, or this, this fear around if I take a psychedelic substance, will I lose my sanity? Will I go permanently insane? Never once in all of the clinical trials that have been done and in, you know, anecdotally, never once has there ever been a case of someone 
who has gone permanently insane from psychedelics who themselves, again, just to reiterate, don't have a history of any kind of psychotic uh, or psycho, um, uh, psychotic episodes or schizophrenia. Uh, so that that's important to address. Now, a lot of people do fear and anxiety uh, are so central to the the, the psychedelic experience, um, and there's so much potentially to be said about this. You know, Joseph Campbell has this this quote that the cave we fear to enter holds the treasure we seek. In the psychotherapeutic process in general, and in what you could call the entire process of self-actualization, realizing our fullest pot potential in this lifetime, constantly demands that we face fears, that we go outside of the comfort zone and challenge ourselves in that way. I think it's really important to differentiate between this idea of a bad trip and a challenging trip. Uh, I'm not quite sure if such a thing as a bad trip even exists at this point, if there is the appropriate uh, set and setting, the appropriate context, the appropriate support around the experience. Because I've seen time and time again, experiences that are extremely challenging. And again, this is also substantiated by the research that psychedelic experiences that are subjectively challenging often yield the most profound, the most enduring uh, uh, positive mental health outcomes. Uh, again, if you look at the psychotherapeutic process, if you're dealing with uh, depression or anxiety or trauma, uh, the process of healing means gradually and incrementally exposing ourselves or bringing awareness to parts of the psyche that are incredibly challenging. And of course, anxiety and fear do tend to increase in the psychotherapeutic process as we work towards this core material, right? So of course, the same is true in psychedelic assisted healing. As the healing process unfolds, as we're facing these parts of the psyche that have been repressed or suppressed, there will be anxiety and there will be fear uh, around those. Not necessarily, but oftentimes there is. However, that is where the gold is. The gold lies just on the other side of, of that fear. And I see this time and time and time again. Uh, I do think that uh, no matter how many times one does psychedelics, there's always a little aspect of, of anxiety or fear going into the experience. Uh, there's a fine line between feeling nervous and feeling excited and going into a psychedelic experience. It's like I'm riding a unicycle uh, down a tightrope, like between the, those those two, you know, uh, and I, I think this is a very very human natural response to something that is is recognized or perceived to be incredibly powerful, incredibly profound, mm -hmm. and I even say, you know, if if someone doesn't feel at least a little bit of that that anxiety uh, going into a, a a big psychedelic experience, I question if they should even be doing it. Do they recognize how profound this experience truly is? Do they recognize, uh, do they have an adequate uh, sense of, of respect or even you could say reverence for, for uh, not just the medicine, but ourselves entering into this, this uh, potentially, you know, life tr changing, transformative uh, peak experience. Uh, so all of that is to say that uh, fear and anxiety are very central uh, or, or, or play a significant role, absolutely, in, this, in the psychedelic experience. The challenge of navigating resistance, of navigating anxiety, of navigating fear is what is profoundly formative. Uh, it increases our window of tolerance, you could say. It increases our resilience, our, our, our fortitude. I guess one other point I'll mention about that is that, you know, two of the deepest fears of humankind is one, the fear of death and one uh, and another is the fear of losing our mind or losing our faculties, losing our sanity. And both of those do come up in the psychedelic experience. Not always, but you know, from time to time, uh, we, we, I've seen people who've been like in the experience convinced that they're losing their mind. I myself have had an experience like that, seen people who are convinced that they're actually dying. Uh, but, uh, Again, this is, this is the alchemical process of healing that unfolds in uh, the psychedelic experience. As we face these challenging, uh, you know, uh, a sense of life or death, death fear, it really, really brings into focus what really matters. It really brings into focus 
uh, what's important. Uh, it, it, it lends such a, a sense of, of, of clarity and also a sense of resilience, as I mentioned. How are you sleeping? Sleep is a foundation of mental and physical health, equally important to nutrition and exercise, yet it's often the first thing to go during times of stress. Good sleep can help alleviate depression and anxiety symptoms, maintain a healthy weight and metabolism, protect your heart, and even reduce the risk of Alzheimer's. Yet still, a third of Americans struggle with sleep, and temperature is one of the main reasons. Before I got an eight sleep, I was already an expert in sleep hygiene and practiced what I preached to my clients. But I would still wake up overheated in the middle of the night and unable to fall back asleep for one or two hours. Adjusting the air temperature and blankets was not enough. The mattress itself was keeping me hot. But now I'm sleeping soundly through the night and waking up refreshed thanks to my 8 Sleep Pod Pro cover. The Pod Pro cover by 8 Sleep is the most advanced solution on the market for thermoregulation. It pairs dynamic cooling and heating with biometric tracking. The cover can adjust the temperature on each side of the bed individually for you and your partner based on your sleep stages, biometrics, and bedroom temperature, reacting intelligently to create the optimal sleeping environment. If you'd like to be more patient with your children, more emotionally stable with your partner, a fitter athlete, or more efficient at work, take it from me, a mental health professional. Improving your sleep is one of the best investments you can possibly make in your overall well-being and the lives of everyone you touch. Go to 8sleep.com to check out the pod and use the code SOMETHERAPIST at checkout to start sleeping cool this summer with up to $200 off your purchase. Even if they're already running another sale, this code will get you an additional $50 off. And yes, to my listeners around the world, 8sleep currently ships not only within the USA, but also to Canada, the UK, select countries in the EU, and Australia. All right, now back to the show. I like how you drew that connection between the psychedelic experience and any experience of exploring the psyche. And it makes me think of spelunking, you know, going underground into a cave. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to find. It's dark and shadowy in there. And it's, and it's exciting. And you normalize that it's healthy to feel fear when you're going into the unknown. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's danger there. But there is challenge, right? And you're also separating the idea of bad from challenging, which I think is just as important in psychotherapy or in any path of personal development, right? Not everything that challenges us or evokes fear of the unknown or evokes questioning of whether we can handle something, not all of those are in the category of bad, right? Many of them are necessary for growth. And we know that human beings are anti-fragile, which means we actually need a certain amount of stress and challenge mm. in order to grow. So psychedelics are kind yes. of a, a heightened, condensed expression of anything where we are going through some kind of challenge that is a growth opportunity. And you're not yes. saying anything foolish here. You're saying that there are certain people with pre-existing conditions or tendencies for whom this would not be a good idea. And you also talked about set and setting. Um, I know many listeners will be familiar with those terms, but can you define set and setting for those who are just hearing this for the first time? Sure, absolutely. So this is this is a an incredibly important uh, aspect of uh, the the psychedelic experience is set and setting. So setting, of course, is the physical location where you are ingesting the substance uh, and. Uh, all of the uh, environmental factors thereof, uh, including who is present, uh, what music is playing, are there dogs barking in the background, like what's going on in, the, in this place. All of the, these environmental factors in the experience can actually uh, evoke profound responses because we're so, we're so sensitive in, in these, in these non-ordinary states uh, and, and suggestible as well. Um, and the, the set is a little more, uh, nuanced, uh, and, and less material. It's, it's your mindset, right? It's your, your state of mind 
going into the experience, what's what's sort of at the fore of your mind? This points to the idea as well of like the the psychedelic experience being a a sort of microcosm of the way that we live our lives in a very broad and general sense. Like all of our psychological history to the moment of ingesting the substance um, as well in, you know, in that bigger picture sense, but also that more sort of acute or short term sense, this all represents the, the mindset or, or the set going in. So the combination of set and setting comes together to form this uh, sort of like this unfolding dance of the, the psychedelic experience. So earlier you mentioned research and you brought up some of that. You talked about, I believe it was neurogenesis in rats. Uh, can you tell us more about what research we have on psychedelics? Yeah, well, the research is, in some senses, it's really in its infancy. I mean, uh, it was absolutely uh, just the, the the feeling around uh, psychedelic research in the 60s and 70s was, was electric, uh, to, to, to my understanding. There was so much excitement about the sort of like transdiagnostic advocacy of these substances where you can use one substance, LSD or psilocybin, and it can address this, 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 and this, um, from addiction to trauma to depression, all these different things. The excitement was very, very real. Then, of course, there was a shutdown, 30 years of break. The first human-based uh, psychedelic research was conducted, I believe, in 1991. It began at the University of New Mexico. There's a guy named Dr. Rick Strassman who wrote a book called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. So he, this was the first human-based psychedelic research in the United States that was you know, legally sanctioned. And he, over the course of five years, he administered more than 400 doses of DMT intravenously to around 60 different uh, uh, research participants. Since that time, research has steadily, steadily uh, been, been gaining momentum and, and picking up speed. MAPS, there's an organization called MAPS, the Multidisciplinary uh, Association for Psychedelic Studies, has uh, led, by, led by Rick Doblin, who's really just been spearheading this movement of, of psychedelic uh, uh, research and, and decriminalization and, and uh, uh, therapeutic legalization, specifically around a substance named MDMA, which has just shown this incredible efficacy in, in addressing uh, PTSD. Um, so that's, that's a really exciting development, and there is more and more research around that. The research into psilocybin as well is growing but limited. Um, so what we've seen is that Johns Hopkins uh, has really been sort of uh, central to, the, to this research, as well as a few other uh, institutions, Imperial College of London, NYU, and a few others. But uh, Johns Hopkins has, some of the, some of the research studies there have, have really established how psilocybin, again, in conjunction with psychotherapeutic support, uh, has unbelievable out outcomes as it relates to a major depressive disorder or treatment-resistant depression. Uh, one of the one of the awesome studies that happened at Johns Hopkins, I, I think this was in 2016. It was done by a man named Roland Griffiths, who is is really a leading uh, researcher in in this field. Uh, they looked at uh, treating uh, people who have terminal cancer or advanced stage uh, cancer, um, and with that, uh, you know, all kinds of of mental health. Uh, uh, symptoms of, of depression, intense anxiety. And of course, it's very clear that, you know, having uh, heightened anxiety and mental health issues uh, worsens the prognosis for, for cancer, increases the degree of subjective pain, literally decreases the life expectancy in these cases. So it's long been recognized how important it is to address uh, this issue um, so, sort of holistically address the mental health component of, of a cancer diagnosis, you know. Um, but uh, I digress. Uh, what, they, what they found there was that uh, after two treatments of psilocybin, 80% of the sample uh, at a six-month follow-up, six-month follow-up after two treatments, 80% of the sample reported uh, clinically significant reductions in their symptoms of depression uh, 60 percent uh, were in full remission, no longer met the clinical criteria for de having depression whatsoever. 60 percent 
this is this is a, a, a truly unbelievable uh, unbelievable finding that's orders of magnitude beyond any other psychiatric intervention that we've ever discovered. Uh, certainly, SSRIs and, and uh, antidepressant medications uh, don't even come close to that. They work in a, in you know around around or less than a third of the population. Even then, when they do when they are effective, it's symptom management, right? Uh, which I'm not, I'm not, uh, I fully respect that people need, uh, in some cases, people need antidepressants to go about their day to get out of bed, fully respect that. But at the same time, at some point, we need to go to the root of the issue. If we want to heal, if healing is our goal, at some point, we need to go to the root of the issue. This is what psilocybin and other psychedelic, uh, medicines have the capacity to do in literally as little as two or three treatments. Two or three exposures to this medicine versus a daily regimen, uh, decades-long daily regimen of, of you know benzodiazepines or SSRIs. I mean, what, what we're talking about here is is a quantum leap, and that's just one example. There have been numerous other studies around psilocybin, and other plant-based psychedelic medicines. Uh, another study found recently that uh, psilocybin is four times more effective than the leading SSRI antidepressant in, when it comes to alleviating the symptoms of, of depression. Some of the research around psychedelics is, is a little more out there than that. Uh, other, other research that has happened at Johns Hopkins did establish that, and this was one of uh, Roland Griffith's earlier studies, I think this was in 2006, uh, just linking the psilocybin experience to uh, mystical experiences. So basically this research sort of reliably found that psilocybin can and reliably does induce these states of consciousness that uh, parallel and and almost perfectly resemble mystical states of consciousness that have been reported and described for thousands of years by advanced meditators and and sages and mystics. And interestingly as well, that, that research did also find that people who report a higher degree of this psychedelic experience also report the most profound and enduring uh, psychological benefits out of the experience. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot there's a lot more to be said that there. I mean, that that's really just the tip of the iceberg. But the idea here is that there is a very rapidly growing field of of legitimate and high quality research into these substances, and so far. Uh, the outcomes have been tremendous and and you could even say revolutionary. Wow. So really encouraging results of trials for treatment of depression. And I'll put that on one end of the spectrum, mystical experience on the other. And I, I would imagine that the um, the end of life treatment for people with it's a terminal cancer diagnosis, right? The people in that study. That would I would imagine that would fall somewhere in between because that's both a depressing situation to be in and a spiritually challenging one because as people are approaching death, they need to come to terms with their relationship with death. So I would imagine that psychedelics could be particularly helpful for people nearing end-of-life issues. It sounds like there was kind of a finding peace with death. It's a brilliant point. Yeah, I think that palliative care, end of life care is one of the most exciting uh, therapeutic applications of psilocybin and other psychedelic medicines because, yeah, this this seems to be the general consensus is that two or three experiences with uh, psilocybin can profoundly alleviate anxiety as it relates to, to death or one's, one's own mortality and just render uh, such a deeper sense of peace and a, mm. and a feeling that uh, in spite of all this, it's okay. You know, mm. everything is okay. Everything is okay. Everything's unfolding as it should be. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, just, it just lends itself to a much more peaceful, spiritually meaningful, and dignified transition. And earlier you mentioned briefly the research on MDMA and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. So this isn't really my area of expertise, but I can give you sort of the broad brush strokes. So the general idea is that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is 
far and away the most effective, successful intervention that we've ever discovered when it comes to the treatment of severe PTSD. A lot of the research has happened around uh, military veterans, people returning from active combat. And the success rate, uh, again, in terms of uh, clinically significant reduction of symptoms is around somewhere around 80%, which is, is really, really phenomenal when you look at some of the, the, the other treatment uh, modalities and, and their success rate. It's very different from psilocybin-assisted therapy for a number of reasons. MDMA is not considered a classic uh, psychedelic uh, or hallucinogen. It's actually often referred to as an empathogen. This is a, a very powerful heart opening, uh, fear and anxiety alleviating experience that doesn't really have any sort of like visual psychedelic effects, but it is absolutely a sort of altered state of consciousness that one enters into. One of the significant differences is that With MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, the talk therapy is happening while the patient or the client, the individual, is under the influence of MDMA. With psilocybin, uh, the talk therapy isn't as much happening uh, while the person is under the influence. It's happening before and after. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's a notable difference there. The sort of the very, very concise and sort of superficial uh, insight into what's what's going on there is that uh, MDMA essentially induces a state of a state of being that is absolutely optimal, ideal for doing this really, really challenging, uh, intense, emotionally challenging work of going and revisiting that 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 trauma and and sort of processing the the trauma that's been stuck and lodged in the body, in the nervous system, you know, and and the reason for that is uh, MDMA really, it, well, there's a, there's a mood elevating component to it. There is a heart opening component to it where social connection is facilitated. So that the sort of therapeutic alliance between the guest or the client and, and the clinician is facilitated profoundly, uh, a sense of social judgment f- really diminishes. And so fear and anxiety around, around judgment, self-judgment, goes down and in a, in a more general sense, because of this mood upliftment uh, or this almost euphoric quality to this substance, it's like anxiety has almost gone out of the window. The person is still in a very, very lucid, clear state of mind to, and, and sometimes I even say even more lucid, even more clear to go back and revisit challenging aspects of their trauma and how that manifests in their life. So it's like less anxiety, high sense of clarity, feelings of, of love and connection and, and feeling supported um, and validated and acknowledged all at, all at the same time. So it really just expedites the therapeutic process. But uh, it, again, it's really important to note that because the talk therapy is happening while the individual is under the influence, the therapist, the clinician, him or herself really needs to meet this with an extremely high degree of competence and experience. I hope you've been enjoying this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast. If you like what you're hearing, now's a great time to like, subscribe, follow, rate, review, or share. You can also support the podcast by visiting sometherapist.com slash shop, where you will find goods and services I have personally curated to support your well-being and enrich your life. We're just building the shop, so check back periodically and feel free to suggest recommendations. All right, now back to the show. So MDMA can help the brain of a traumatized person access a state that would ordinarily be really hard to access because we know that trauma creates a lot of reactivity, hypervigilance, heightened anxiety in the brain, and that can make it difficult to resume normal life or to to just have any peace in your life because the brain in that state is kind of primed to pick up on potential dangers and always be in that state of threat. So I can really see the value of adding something that shuts down that fear response, elevates trust and openness and insight, gives the brain a break from that reactivity and then allows for a safe environment to reprocess that trauma with someone who's in a good position to help them. I wanted to ask you about hallucinations. So earlier when you were comparing the difference between MDMA and psilocybin and other hallucinogens, 
you said with MDMA, they don't get visuals, for example. So how would you compare and contrast the actual experience of hallucinations or, as someone say, delusions, hallucinations being more of the senses and delusions being more of the mind under the influence of psychedelics with those that are either associated with a state of psychosis or with people's fears in general of hallucinating? What are some myths and misconceptions? What's actually true about the nature of hallucinations under the influence of hallucinogens? Yeah, well, you know, someone, I guess, I guess a significant difference is that this is a transient state when you're, when you're in a psychedelic experience. There is an ability to distinguish between hallucination versus what you could say objective or, or consensus reality after the the subjective effects of the, the experience wears off. It's a time-limited experience. Usually in the experience as well, uh, there's an ability to differentiate what is the trip, you could say, versus what is sort of consensus reality. But that that's not always the case. I mean, uh, historically, psychedelics have been uh, termed psychotomimetics. Uh, this is one of the reasons why people were really interested in in researching them in the 60s and 70s, because a lot of people were, were very convinced uh, that they're, these could offer an insight into uh, working with and addressing and alleviating schizophrenia and, and psychosis, which I'm not sure if, if that has turned out to, to quite be the case. The word hallucination is, is an interesting one to me because it seems to suggest a lack of truth or veracity to the experience. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's a fantasy. There's, it doesn't mm-hmm. correspond in any sense to reality. It's all mind-based. Mm-hmm. You know, in many, in many cases, this is true. However, I also think that there's, there's potentially, in, su- in a select number of cases, something much, much more interesting going on. And Aldous Huxley wrote, wrote this book called The Doors of Perception, and he was talking about an experience he had with mescaline, which is the psychoactive component in uh, the peyote cactus in, in uh, San Pedro. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful psychedelic substance. And what he was saying was that the brain essentially acts as a, a reducing valve. In any moment, there are so many sensory inputs. There's so much information that the mind and the brain is bombarded with at any given moment, that as an evolutionary mechanism, the brain has developed as this sort of filtering mechanism that filters out only the most essential information. This is an important thing. When we're crossing the street, we need to be aware if a car is coming at us, right? And keep ourselves safe. But what I'm I'm getting at here is that uh, psychedelics, and and, and this was Huxley's uh, position, his sort of, he asserted that in some cases, what, what psychedelics do is to open doors of perception, to expand this reducing valve of the mind. So rather than just getting a sort of hallucinatory, fantastical experience that has no basis in reality, uh, there's actually a, a sense of an expanded uh, perception of reality, which is really interesting. And I, and I mean, this is actually true in, so, in some cases that uh, some historical uses of psilocybin were around hunting because it actually, at lower doses, can increase visual acuity as well as auditory sensory perceptual mechanisms. The sensitivity is is increased in 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 many cases. So there is this hallucinatory hallucinatory component to it that in some in some cases could be compared to a sort of dreamlike state, but. There is potentially, I'm actually convinced of this, there's something deeper going on here than these are all just uh, brain-based hallucinations because there are these states of consciousness, for example, the mystical experience, uh, that people all throughout all throughout time, all throughout human history, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people at this point who have reported these experiences that share, very clearly share the same core characteristics. You know, they're described in language that is reflective of their sociocultural religious background. But if you kind of strip away the sociocultural components and look at the, the, the core characteristics, there's a remarkable uh, similarity to mystical states of consciousness and, and these peak uh, psychedelic experiences or these peak uh, spiritual experiences that have been reported uh, all around the world for thousands of years. So the reason I bring that up is because the question is like, 
are all of these thousands of people from around the world and throughout time somehow hallucinating the same or similar experiences? I mean, does that does that make sense given uh, such disparate and, and varied and diverse sociocultural religious backgrounds? Or is there something more going on here? Could it be that psychedelics represent a tool just in the same way that we use a telescope to peer into the sky? We're looking through a lens. We're getting a tool. We can't see the depth of the cosmos ordinarily with our, you know, just normal sense perception. But when we look through the telescope, that itself is not deemed as a hallucination, right? Mm. I do believe that psychedelics represent a tool or a telescope or a lens for peering inwardly into the nature of mind, into the nature of consciousness itself, and exploring the human condition, exploring the nature of reality, essentially. So there's a very broad range here. I mean, the psychedelic experience is is just as vast and varied and diverse as the human experience is, right? So it can't be boxed up into this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. It's like there's there's an ocean of possibility is what is what I'm suggesting. And I think it it it's on it does it does a disservice to the mystery of the experience when people label these as hallucinations without knowing, you know? I love it. All right, so Jonas, we've spent a lot of time talking about psilocybin, and that's the main psychedelic that's used at your retreat center, right? That's right, yeah. So what are the other types of psychedelics? Yeah, well, there there are many, many different uh, psychoactive substances, psychedelic substances. Um, so I had mentioned uh, NNDMT, dimethyltryptamine. Uh, that was the research of, of Dr. Rick Strassman that I, I mentioned earlier. There's a number of them. There's another one called 5-MeO DMT, which is a toxin that's produced naturally in the Sonoran Desert Toad, Bufo alvarius. So NNDMT and 5-MeO DMT share some similarities, but are, are also very, very different in terms of their subjective effects. They're commonly regarded as the two most powerful, uh, most, most quick-acting uh, psychedelic substances that very often induce these uh, spiritually profound or, or spiritually meaningful experiences. But yeah, again, there, there are a number of others. Mescaline is a, is a plant-based psychedelic that's found in peyote in uh, San Pedro cactus that have also been used for hundreds, if not thousands of years by indigenous peoples around, around the world. Uh, I think I already mentioned earlier, I meant to mention that NNDMT is, is the psychoactive compound found in ayahuasca, which is a, a shamanic brew that has been used as well for thousands of years in the, the Amazon basin. There's, of course, LSD, which was first synthesized and discovered by Al- Albert Hoffman. Really interesting story behind the discovery of that. Hoffman termed it uh, an accident that was supposed to happen, which is, is very interesting. Um, then there, there's, there, there are a number of others. Uh, Salvia divinorum is, is another plant that has... Uh, profound psychoactive effects. Those are some of the main ones that are, are coming to mind. There's this entire class of research chemicals. So there, there are all these different substances like 4-ACO DMT, which is sort of similar in its effects in its molecular structure to psilocybin. There's 2CB, 2CE, 2CI. There's all these different research compounds. There's, a, there's quite, a, quite a list that would take a while to, to go through every single one, nor do I even know of, of every single one. Uh, ketamine and MDMA are, are two psychoactive compounds, which, as I mentioned, aren't classical uh, psychedelics. Uh, however, they are kind of often uh, part of the conversation around psychedelic-assisted therapy. Ketamine is a dissociative. MDMA is actually an amphetamine, but it's, as I mentioned, often regarded as an empathogen, as a heart-opening experience. There's another one called MDA. There's a long, quite a long list of, of different substances here. And why might someone choose one over another? Yeah, that's a good question. It all depends on, on the goals and interests of the individual as well as the accessibility of, of different substances, you know, um, in different regions of the world. There's greater or lesser access to certain substances, to certain experiences. You know, as I mentioned before, like a person with who's suffering from, from PTSD might do really well with uh, MDMA. 
Uh, there's another psychedelic substance, which I forgot to mention previously, called ibogaine. This, it, it comes from the aboga plant, which is indigenous or local to Central Africa. And ibogaine is a, is a really, really interesting and exceptional substance. And it's been found to be extraordinarily effective in treat, treatment of, of addiction and, and sub, substance abuse. So people who are habituated to hard, hard substances like uh, methamphetamines, like, like heroin, after one or two treatments with ibogaine, not only do they stop cold turkey, but they also don't have any, any withdrawal symptoms. It's really quite exceptional. So to some extent, it depends on any pre-existing uh, conditions or, or mental, mental health uh, conditions that the individual might have that might lead them in one uh, towards one experience rather than the other versus if a, if a person is looking for more of a, of a spiritual experience, they might tend more towards DMT, one, uh, either 5-MeO or NN dimethyltryptamine. I do think that, you know, as sort of like general advice, everyone is unique and different. I think that it's, it's generally recommended to not start with with either of the DMTs as your, your first psychedelic experience, just because they are so powerful and profound. And, and to the extent that uh, even if one has a subjectively positive experience in the moment, it can be destabilizing. It can be hard to integrate these really, really powerful experiences. So, you know, as, as just very broad general advice, I would, I would tend to recommend uh, a low to medium dose in a, in a safe and supportive setting of either psilocybin or LSD or mescaline before going to either of the DMTs. Yeah, as general advice, I would recommend before either of the DMTs t- that people start with a, a low to medium dose uh, in, a, in a safe and supportive setting of either psilocybin or LSD or, or, or mescaline or even ayahuasca. And you know, as, as well, another factor here is that uh, some people are looking more for a shamanic experience. Others are looking for more of a sort of like Western clinical uh, modern medicine type experience. It, there, there's, there's quite a broad spectrum in terms of the different uh, contexts, professional contexts, uh, that these, these substances are being administered. Um, ayahuasca tends to fall more in the sort of shamanic context, it's, it's, it's more difficult to separate ayahuasca from its uh, cultural, religious, shamanic roots than something like psilocybin, which the psilocybin mushroom, of course, has appeared on pretty much every corner of the globe, whereas ayahuasca is native to this specific area and this uh, specific like shamanic cultural domain. So, so that's a factor as well. So on your channel, your channel is called Cosmic Consciousness, and you talk about consciousness, you talk about, I don't know if you prefer the words awakening or enlightenment or evolution. I'm curious about some of the themes that are important to you around spiritual growth and transformation, as well as some of the peak experiences that perhaps you've had, perhaps other people you know have had that have uh, been a part of their process of enlightenment? You know, thank you for asking that. There, there is a lot to be said here. I, I do think that the use of psychedelics extends far beyond just the uh, a strictly sort of clinical model. Pretty much the entire conversation around, you know, s- psychedelics in modern Western society is around its therapeutic application which is huge, immense, and I absolutely believe revolutionary. But in some ways, that's only just the beginning. As I mentioned before, I do think that just as we use a telescope to peer more deeply into space, these represent tools for exploration of the nature of mind, of consciousness, of the human condition, and the nature of reality in a more general sense. And through increasing our self-awareness, through sort of inward-oriented attention, where we're looking deeper, deeper into the, the mind, into the subconscious or the unconscious. This is how we move towards healing, but how we also move towards what you could call self-actualization, which is like the fruition of our greatest potential, the, the full blossoming of the human being, right? And these are very, very powerful tools for increasing self-awareness, which I would say is 
the fundamental mechanism of all healing as well as all spiritual growth and evolution. I can tell you like kind of quickly, like my story, I, I, I spent the first 19 or 20 years of my life as, as an atheist, as a materialist. I was very, very convinced that there is no consciousness beyond the physical brain. Consciousness is an epiphenomenon of the complex interaction of neurons in the brain. When the brain ceases to function, consciousness no longer exists. And as a result of that materialistic worldview, the word spirituality really meant nothing to me from that sort of materialist or, or material reductionist framework. There's nothing more to what we are than this one physical body and brain. I now see quite differently. I did have a, a number of experiences from my very first psilocybin experience, I would say. Uh, this is what I would call my first encounter with the miraculousness, the sacredness of life. It was a very humbling experience. From that very first experience, I realized that everything is a mystery. There is a mysterious and you could even a miraculous quality to every single blade of grass, every tiny insect, every tree, every leaf. I realized that the fact that my heart was beating, that my heart is beating without even trying is a truly miraculous thing that has somehow emerged out of billions of years of cosmic evolution where there's there's this awe-inspiring beauty and synchronicity that orchestrates the inconceivable complexity of this one human body, much less the entire cosmos unfolding in this way. So that was kind of like the first crack in the, the hardened shell of like materialism for me. But, you know, after that point, through my exploration of, of NN dimethyltryptamine, I did have these experiences that subjectively felt like an out-of-body experience where the last layer of my humanity, the identity of Jonas, was stripped away. It felt like all that was left of what I was was the pure awareness or the pure consciousness, the very essence of my being, the life force, the chi, soul, spirit, whatever we want to call it. And yet I felt more myself than ever before. I felt that I was in a another realm or dimension of existence beyond the physical universe. Just opened my eyes so profoundly to the realization that there is so much more to the mystery of life than what meets the eye. There's so much more to the mystery of self than this one physical body. The largest ever survey of DMT experiencers was recently done in 2019 at, at Johns Hopkins University. It's an online survey of like 2,500 DMT users. Get this, among the group of, of people who self-identified as an atheist before the experience, after this experience, this is a 15-minute experience with DMT. It only lasts 15 minutes in earth time. 50% of those people no longer identified in, as an atheist following the wow. experience. So 50% of people who self-identified as an atheist before DMT no longer identified as an atheist after DMT. That is how powerful these substances are. Again, this is a 15-minute experience that subjectively goes to the very core, the very heart of the biggest questions, the biggest metaphysical questions about the nature of life and, and reality and changes people's per perspective on the nature of this mystery of life, right? And so all, all of this is to say that through increasing our awareness, both inwardly and you could, you could say outwardly, healing is a natural outcome of that. But also as one increases our awareness at a certain point, and increasing awareness also requires a willingness to release or relinquish uh, flawed core beliefs, right? Which most of us hold on to very, very dearly. In increasing our awareness, in rel relinquishing flawed beliefs, seeing beyond the limitations of the mind, inevitably, inevitably, somewhere along the journey, we will bump into the sacred. Whatever that means to us, we will encounter the fact that all of this, literally every single iota of existence is mysterious, miraculous, uh, incredible, incredible beyond conception. And I do think that um, one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so 
enthused by by the field of of psychedelics is because I believe it represents a intersection between science and spirituality, right? It's very important that we remain grounded in science, but also bring in this spiritual component in into our exploration of, of the nature of, of life and, and self. And as we do this, you know, I'll, 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 say, I'll say as well that even from a purely scientific lens, consciousness itself is arguably the greatest mystery facing modern science today. Every single one of us is conscious. There's no experience of life without consciousness, and yet no one truly knows. No one truly knows what consciousness is. The hard problem of consciousness is one of the greatest mysteries, one of the greatest unanswered questions facing modern science today. And through this this psychedelic exploration, I, I do believe that it unlocks different possibilities or different theoretical frameworks for understanding what we are that is that is much more expansive than a purely physicalist or material reductionist idea. So those experiences with DMT, where I felt like Jonas was gone and yet I was more me than ever before in some sort of a uh, sacred or, or metaphysical or transcendent place, transcendent realm outside of space and time, convinced me that there is more to what we are than flesh and bone, that there is more to what we are than just this one human identity, than this one lifetime. And of course, this is what the ancients from around the world, all of the ancient mystics, all of the spiritual visionaries, all of the prophets, all of the shamans in their own unique ways, they all have taught universally that there is this essence to our being that is transcendent, that is beyond this physical lifetime, and that there's so much more to this mystery of life than what meets the eye, you know? And so this experience opens the doorway, it certainly did for me, open the doorway to uh, f- being firmly grounded in, in science and yet also acknowledging that literally everything is a mystery and the possibilities encompassed in the mystery are so much greater than anything, anything that modern science had, has even begun to discover and anything that can be observed or measured in, in a purely materialist uh, framework. I love that. So have you worked with many people who come from not an atheist background, but a religious background? Because I'm imagining that certain people listening to this who have a religion, such as Christianity, that maybe there's some pre-existing framework that, you know, something like psychedelics maybe in their religion are considered evil or taboo or some way, in some way. Have you worked with people coming from different religious backgrounds and what are their experiences like? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think what's, what's so powerful about the psychedelic experience is that we are our own authority in the exploration of truth. It's an inward experience. And what I mean by this is there's no figurehead. There's no preacher or pastor or monk or whoever it is. There's no guru who's telling us this is how it is. We're exploring inwardly and coming to our own conclusions. Now, importantly, those conclusions are shaped and colored by the framework that we have of making, interpreting, analyzing, and making sense out of these experiences. So, yeah, I have I have worked with people who come from a sort of orthodox uh, religious background, and I think in in some cases I've seen that to be a limiting factor. In other cases, I've seen that to be a tremendously empowering factor. I have seen a number of people arrive at the experience with this very sort of wary, leery sense that like, is this demonic? Like, is this the devil's work? Really? And that's a delicate place to be. I think that certainly it's not the role of a facilitator to impose my thoughts, beliefs, perspectives on anyone else. That's a very clear ethical line that's not to be crossed. However, I think that having some degree of mental flexibility or this like cognitive openness, you could say, is really instrumental in terms of getting the most out of the psychedelic experience. And that does usually happen in a pretty organic way, like as a person goes from the first to the second to the third experience, where they learn to trust their own inner experience rather than these, these hand-me-downs of religious or, or cultural teachings and belief systems that they've sort of been indoctrinated 
with from a young age. But again, I have seen as well people having a religious background or framework as yielding a sense of profound empowerment and just being really like inwardly resourced in navigating these experiences. So it's a double-edged sword there and it's it's all what the individual makes of it, right? Yeah, so I'm hearing that one difference between the psychedelic religious experience and the religious religious experience is that when someone has a religious practice, there's sort of a a mediator between the self and God, if you will, that it's it's the preacher or the rabbi or the scripture. The religion serves as a go-between and a translator of sorts. And that with the psychedelic experience, there's no middleman. You're just kind of going straight to the source. And so that can be scary for people who think that that's inappropriate or outside of the bounds of their religion. And that could, if they were to try it anyway, that that would be part of the sort of set and setting. That would be part of the mindset that could contribute to a more challenging experience or a more limited experience. But that for those who don't have that limitation, it could actually deepen their faith by allowing them to tap into something in themselves that has their own direct connection to source. Yes, beautifully said. So, I mean, I think with all this conversation, it's it's clear to most people, if they didn't already know, that psychedelics are a very different class of substances from other drugs that are currently illegal in the United States. But what would you say to someone who thinks that, you know, all drugs should be illegal and that there's no difference between, let's say, LSD and heroin or cocaine? It's a denial of the fact. You know, I'm sorry. This isn't this isn't about like beliefs or, or, or dogma. It's a lack of, of awareness. It's a lack of a knowledge of, of what's a science, you know? There, there's far and away enough, enough research that's out there in all these different classes of, of substances to distinguish, to make, to make very clear just, just how, how significant the, difference, the differences are. And I guess most of that can be encapsulated by the idea that psychedelics, when used in a therapeutic context, in a supportive context, represent a move towards wholeness. They represent a move towards healing. And, and they also represent a move towards facing and addressing conflict in our life. These other substances like heroin, not to judge anyone who's, who's using that. I mean, I don't know much about this substance myself personally, but very often substance addiction or abuse is not coming from a move towards healing and wholeness. It's coming from a place of pain. It's, it's coming from a place of wounding. It's coming from a need for escape, a numbing, aversion, or avoidance rather than a confronting of the issues that are at the core of why we're uh, experiencing pain or pain or suffering. So this is why psilocybin and other psychedelic uh, substances are, not only are they not addictive, they kind of go in the opposite direction. They're not habit for me at all. You know, these like experiments with the mice hitting the lever, they'll go back and keep hitting the lever for cocaine or heroin. They won't <laughs> for psilocybin because this is not an escape. This is not a, an escape from the issues that plague us. This is an addressing. This is a move towards the issues that plague us so that we can heal them, so that we can integrate them, so that we can bring them into the the wholeness of our being. So, you know, that's just one differentiation from sort of like a, a psychotherapeutic framework that psychedelics are moving towards healing and wholeness while other other experiences aren't. They're they're numbing. But there, again, there is also these, these deeper elements to the psychedelic experience as well that, that touch on all these different aspects of, of the human experience from relationships to the creative impulse within us to the spiritual impulse within us. And so this represents a depth of experience, a vastness that is simply not present whatsoever in some of these other classes of substances. It's not at all fair to lump some of these these plant-based psychedelics in with like, I don't know, tobacco or, well, you know, alcohol, crystal meth, different substances like this. It's an it's, it's, it's a entirely uh, different uh, experience subjectively and, 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 and scientifically. So this is what's really wonderful about 
the research that's been coming out, there is a stigma around psychedelic substances, but uh, stigma can't survive for too long in the face of fact, in, in the face of objective data, in the face of rigorous scientific investigation, because this is parsing out what's, what's myth, what's belief, what's indoctrination versus the reality of the situation. Wow, Jonas. Well said. Let's talk about behavior change, right? So we've talked about what happens when a person is in the psychedelic experience. We've talked about the realizations and insights, the halting of the default mode network, which I think is connected to why psychedelics are kind of the opposite of addictive substances. Because like you said, they're confronting the problem head on rather than numbing and escaping and avoiding. And their psychedelics awaken the consciousness that can stop and go, wait, why do I always go toward that familiar habit? There's so much more I could be doing. And wow, now I understand everything that's led me into that familiar habit and I'm ready to release it, right? So you talk about how they're very opposite experiences. And one of well, you've, you've shared a few of the results in people's lives, right? So that for yourself and for many other people, a single psychedelic experience changes your spiritual worldview from atheist to a sense of awe at something mysterious. And we've talked a little bit about, um, you know, the alleviation from post-traumatic stress, major depressive disorder, and you've talked about creativity. So in your life, personally or professionally, what have you seen the long-term behavior changes in people's lives look like before and after psychedelics? Yeah, well, I think it's worth mentioning these are not always uh, subjectively felt to be spiritually profound experiences. That's certainly not the case for everyone. Uh, in, in, in a significant percentage of cases, that is that is the case, but it's not always the case by any means. Yeah, in terms of of lasting outcomes, I mean, you could say that th- this experience is often compared to you know ten years of therapy in in over the span of a a single week. Uh, so you can think of the lasting outcomes of of effective uh, therapeutic interventions. You know, these potentially touch every domain of our life, from relationships to career to our inner state of of well being. Um, our sort of like baseline in terms of, of uh, mood and subjective psychological wellness, usually the outcomes are incredibly positive. So we do tend to see a significant increase in sort of that baseline of subjective wellness that does then cascade into uh, positive change in, in all domains of life. But it's important to say as well that it is what the individual makes of the experience, right? So it's it's just like the metaphor that I was using earlier of peering through a telescope. Uh, the astronomer does not spend all of his or her time peering through the lens. There comes a point where he or she needs to go away and work on their findings. And the same is true with the psychedelic experience. And what I'm pointing to is the fact that the outcomes are, to a large extent, what the individual makes the outcomes to be. This is the all important phase of integration, right? Like to what degree are we translating the new insights, the new awareness that was gleaned in the psychedelic experience into real world change in changing maladaptive behaviors, in switching around habits, in making any relationship or career changes that are necessary. So this doesn't all just happen magically in the psychedelic experience. There's work that's required after the experience. And that's where a lot of the magic happens. That's where most of the magic happens, you could say. But I mean, when it comes to things like release of trauma, I mean, somatic cellular release of trauma, there's this, uh, usually, you know, the day after this experience, people subjectively report a tremendous sense of lightness, levity, like they've just unloaded or unburdened something that's really weighty. A lot of people say, like, I, didn't, I wasn't even aware that I was carrying around so much with me all the time. There's a tremendous sense of vitality that is freed up when the nervous system is, is cleansed in that way when these emotional or energetic blockages are released, are resolved, 
when there is the this profound emotional release or catharsis, the natural outcome of that is almost, you could say, without any work, that a change has already transpired. A change has already happened on, on a physiological, somatic, neuro, neurochemical, nervous system level. This experience leads itself very naturally to a sort of a greater baseline of wellness where, as, as you were talking about earlier, there's less of that sense of, of hypervigilance. There's less of that sense of just the cloud, that heavy, dark cloud of depression hanging around all the time. But then, of course, again, there is this question of, okay, like, how do we nurture this? How do we uh, continue to let that grow in our life rather than getting, you know, making great progress, but then falling back into sort of older habituated ways of, of being. So the outcomes are tremendous. They are immense, but they require work, you know. So for people who do use psychedelics or are thinking about using psychedelics and aren't planning on visiting Jamaica or Peru anytime soon, Um, Obviously, I can't recommend that anyone do something illegal, but just kind of from a harm reduction standpoint, right? As someone who's an expert in this, if someone is thinking about using a psychedelic substance outside of any kind of professional supportive environment, what advice would you give that person to try to minimize the risk of it being overwhelmingly challenging or, or support being able to maximize the benefits. There's a lot to be said here. I mean, I think it's it's very case specific. I would say, uh, what is what is this individual working through at the moment, and what are their goals or or aspirations? What do they hope is the outcome through the psychedelic experience? Uh, it's case specific, but that being said, there there is generalizable feedback uh, that we can get. I mean, in a very practical and pragmatic sense, like. It's really important to have a good container for your experience. This goes to the set and setting that we were talking about earlier. Even for, you know, seasoned psychonauts who have had many, many experiences, this is still extremely important that not only is there like a good sort of set and setting, but also that there is a facilitator or someone present there to just really ensure safety and to maximize outcomes in the more far out extremes of these experiences, it can be hard to differentiate between reality versus experience. Even for an experienced psychonaut, if you're if you're at a place where you feel like you might be losing your mind or you might be dying, to have a facilitator there who can just comfort and reassure you really, really helps to maximize the outcomes. I guess you could say like in a general sense, uh, optimizing the experience means going into it with, to some degree, a just being very conscious and cognitive of the mindset going going into this. To what degree have you been practicing self-care? You know, to what degree have you already been uh, cultivating a sense of uh, self-awareness and have a sense of key issues or key themes in your life that you might want to work work through? You know, to what degree do you feel open and ready to go to those to, to those places? Uh, these are all indicators of, I guess you could say, readiness or ripeness for the experience. If there's something there and you, within you and you know that this is an issue I need to work on, you feel very ready to, to work through it, this is likely an indicator that this is, it's, it's time. It's time. You know, I think that doing, participating in therapy, going into it a, 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 prior to an experience is really, really helpful for sort of beginning this process of expanding self-awareness. I think that meditation is so, and, and, and mindfulness practices are so, so fundamental to maximizing uh, outcomes here with this experience. I mean, you know, even just using the, the symbol or the, the idea of a telescope, I think that meditation is almost like the tripod on which the telescope rests. You know, it can stabilize you in this experience and, and help you to get so much more useful data and information from the experience because it's like through meditation and mindfulness, we're cultivating this like the non-judgmental observing part of the mind, getting in touch with inner stillness, the greater to degree to which we're not constantly lost in the monkey mind, this sort of like hamster wheel of like anal- analytical or, or conceptual like 
thinking, judging, analyzing, that can only take us so far in healing. In the psychedelic experience, the greater degree to which we can rest in stillness, be present in this sort of like non-judgmental observer mode, uh, and just be meditative in the experience, this will facilitate the entire process and really expedite really expedite healing and evolution because a core a core theme in the psychedelic experience there is a subtle art to psychedelic navigation you know you could call it the subtle art of letting go and the opposite of letting go is resisting right like if the experience is moving in a direction it's like no i don't want to go there it's too scary or overwhelming all the resistance is generated from the mind if we have an ability to rest in, in stillness and in presence, uh, the degree of resistance diminishes so much. And again, this just makes the entire experience subjectively so much smoother, so much so much easier and, and enjoyable. But again, there, there's a lot to potentially be said here. I think that going into the experience, you know, reading material and learning from other psychonauts, other sort of the, the elders in this in this space, learning from the elders is really, really important. And just trusting, opening and, and letting go. And, you know, the last sort of practical piece, I would say, is getting your dosage right. You know, you don't want to you don't want to start with a crazy dose. You don't want to throw yourself into the deep end of the pool. It's really, really, really important for, for safety reasons that you take sort of a gradual and incremental approach to slowly increasing dosage over a period of time. Wow, Jonas, is there anything we haven't covered? (laughs) Oh, well, there's a lot. I mean, (laughs) I don't think it's possible to cover everything in one podcast. It is a little bit like this experience is uh, the more you know, the less you know. Mm -hmm. The horizons of the experience are are, are ever, ever expanding, ever expanding. And again, it does encompass so many domains of, of the human experience. Uh, that's really, really an, an incredible thing. All right. And since there is so much more to cover, I mean, you talk about that on your YouTube channel. So there's a perfect time to share. Where can people find more about you and your work? Thank you. Um, yeah. Well, I do have a YouTube channel. It's called Cosmic Consciousness with Jonas. I do talk a lot about psychedelics as well as a number of, of different topics related to uh, consciousness and sort of the intersection of, of science and spirituality. I've also got a website called intervisionpsychedelics.com uh, where I offer uh, independent uh, uh, integration coaching and, and uh, consultation around uh, the psychedelic experience. So feel free to reach out to me uh, through either of those platforms. And, uh, mm. you know, always a true pleasure to meet others who are exploring this experience and, and just explore together. So if there were someone who, let's say, was in the States and had obtained some kind of psychedelics in whatever manner they did and they were going to use them on their own, then they would have you as a resource where they could talk to you before or after that experience to help them integrate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So there's sort of the the preparation phase of feeling like we're in a good headspace going into the experience um, and sort of, you know, going over some of the, the flight instructions, you could say, the, this, the, the art of psychedelic navigation. And then afterwards, yeah, this really all important phase of, of integration, like now that we've had this uh, potentially super profound experience, what do we do with it? You know, how do we create real, real life, real world transformation uh, as a result of it? Uh, that's the difference between, you know, an interesting or a, an exciting memory, a good experience in the past versus uh, uh, transformation. Wow. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderfully enlightening conversation. I'm so glad that you were able to make it. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast with Stephanie Wynn, LMFT. This podcast is produced by Eric and Amber Beals at Different Mix. Special thanks to the talented musician Joey Pecorero for our theme song, Half Awake. At SomeTherapist.com, you can find more information on any topic, guest, resource, product, or service you've heard of here today. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at SomeTherapist. If you would like to ask a question, suggest a topic, be a guest, or invite me to speak, you can email us at hello at SomeTherapist.com. 
you can also send us a voice memo with your question, and we just might play it. Of course, just because I'm some therapist doesn't mean I'm your therapist. This podcast is not a substitute for medical advice. If you need help, ask your doctor or browse your local therapists online. And whatever you do next, please take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, get outside, and tell someone you love them. You're worth it.